Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. When training a new client on case acceptance techniques or how to organize their practice to increase case acceptance, for whatever reason, the majority of, a new, of new clients will think that these new ideas are only for use with new patients. In other words, not for the patients that are already there, the patients of record, your charts, whatever you want to call it, but only for new patients. And I understand logically how people arrive at this. You know, it might be a thought along the lines of, well, you know, my current patients are used to the old me. I don't want to shake things up too much or, you know, the old way I did things. So with these new patients, we'll show them the new me or the new way our practice is going to operate. In other words, the person is conceiving that they're going to remake their practice over time as they acquire more new patients. And so, so yeah, I get it. I get the thought process. It doesn't mean that it works, but I get it. So how should this work? Well, let me introduce a little bit about what I'll be discussing this week by saying that 60%, actually more, more than 60% of your monthly revenues, month in, month out, should be coming from patients of record, patients that are already there. And this flies in the face of the idea that if you want to increase collections, you have to go get more new patients. I'm not saying you shouldn't, and I'm not trying to make you take new patients lightly. Of course, they are important. But again, the majority of your revenues should be coming from people who are already there. And I don't just mean from hygiene. I mean, you know, on the doctor's schedule as well. Okay. And if you want to have a little bit more subjective reality on this, I invite you to look at your, your incomplete treatment list. You know, I've had people do this and sometimes it's in the millions and millions of dollars, you know, and people refer to it as, you know, the list of missed opportunities. I call it the not closed list, uh, meaning that these patients aren't closed for treatment, but these are patients who are already in your practice, who you've already met, who already know who you are for what you've actually diagnosed a treatment plan. And seeing this increase in revenue is something that we see with a client who does the MGE communications and sales seminars. I'll put a link to it on the episode webpage, but we'll have a client come to one of these seminars and maybe they're doing 60 or 70,000 a month and the next month they do 95 and then they do a hundred and then they do 105 and you know, they're, they're in the nineties now. But initially that first month or two, they weren't really seeing any bump from any marketing yet because the marketing didn't have time to actually kick in. So where was this revenue increase coming from? It was coming from their existing patient base, people who were already there. And before we get all caught up in the numbers and you know how much we're going to make or accusing ourselves about being all about dollar signs or something like this, let me ask you three questions. First one would be, what is the purpose of a or your dental practice? I mean, for most, it'll be to get patients healthy, to improve patients overall, you know, oral health and thereby their systemic health or, you know, restore function, aesthetic and, uh, you know, things of that nature, right? And uh, so the purpose of a practice is to make patients healthier. The next question is, should patients pay for these services that you're rendering? You know, are they of any value to them or in general? Of course they are. So of course they should pay for them. Number three is, is it better for the patient, their overall and overall health if they do their entire treatment plan versus only doing a part of it, you know, or versus only doing what insurance covers? If I need six crowns and I do all six, is that better for me? Yeah, of course it is. That's better for my oral health as well as my overall health. Now, it also happens to be better for you as the dentist. You have the satisfaction of you know restoring my health and doing a larger treatment plan. It's also better for your practice's revenues. This is truly a win-win situation. You win and I as the patient wins. So sure, you're going to benefit, but so do they. And it also helps you achieve the purpose or mission of your business. So it's it's not all about the money. It's about getting patients healthy. And if you're getting more patients healthy or healthier, you, you will happen to make more revenue. That's the way to think with this. So 
How do we go about recapturing these lost treatment opportunities in your patient base while at the same time increasing practice revenues and improving your patient's health? Well, that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode. My name is Jeff Bloomberg, and I'm your host. And generally speaking, this is what I'll be covering uh, this week, there were four major reasons your practice is missing out on these opportunities that we're going to get into. And to start, and like I mentioned earlier in the introduction, Here's what I'd suggest. If you want to start off on the right foot, you, if you're at your practice, you can pause while you're you're doing this. Um, you know, or you can check if you're listening to this in the car. You can check it when you get to the office. First thing I would like you to do is look at the amount of treatment that you've diagnosed over the last five years that has not been done. Like total it up. First off, look at just the amount of treatment, the pages and pages of incomplete treatment. That'd be the first thing I would do. And then usually most software will tell you the dollar amount associated with these incomplete treatment plan. This doesn't even take into account patient's health. You know that that this is what this is all about anyway, okay? So I'm not going to keep bringing it up, but look at the impact this has had on your business. I've had folks do this, and like I said, it's $2 million, $3 million, $1 million. This is a lot of missed opportunities, and it starts to give you an idea on what's actually going on in your office. So how do we start getting patients from that list onto your schedule? So let's get into these four reasons. What's the first one? Well, let let me give you an example. had a client and uh, actually happened to be at their practice when this was happening, and I sat in on their morning meeting, and we're looking at uh, the patients that they're seeing for the day, and one of the first patients in hygiene was this lady. I don't think I violated HIPAA by saying uh, their gender here, but there was this lady, and uh, she needed three, dollars $4,000 worth of treatment. And I asked about it, who's going to present this treatment plan to this lady because she was just there for a recall appointment. And the office manager said, oh, well, you know, she's a janitor at the local hospital. Um, She paid for a more comprehensive treatment plan last year, so she's already probably still paying that off. She won't be able to afford it. That was the instant response. So I asked, well, have you spoken to her about the balance of this treatment plan? Well, yeah, she was here six months ago, and I talked to her about it for a minute. I go, well, were you planning on talking to her today? Well, no, I was not. I said, okay. So, the, and I forget ex- the exact analogy I used, but it was something along the lines of, you know, you never know if you can get something unless you ask. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we get things we didn't ask for, but, you know, if you don't ask, you're definitely not going to get it in most cases. So, uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of variations to that analogy. You know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, et cetera. So I said, well, why don't you just present the treatment anyway? The doctor would present it, explain the finances associated with it, and then see if she wants to do it. The office manager was sure this was going to be a complete waste of time. So they did, and she accepted it, and financed it, and it wasn't a problem. And I remember walking by the front desk and the office manager giving me one of these funny grins, like, you know, ha, 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 yeah, you were right. So in a lot of cases, the reason why you're missing out on a lot of these opportunities is because we have a preconceived notion about what the person is going to say. You know, we spoke to Bill. When he was here for his perio maintenance three months ago about those four inlays and Bill said no. So therefore, why why should we bother presenting it to Bill again because Bill always says no? Well, you know, without getting into the specifics behind this, uh, there's a reason why you would reiterate something. This is a very well-known marketing concept or datum in that when you're marketing, you're constantly repeating a message over and over and over and over and over again to where you really get it embedded in people's heads. And sometimes it takes a while for them to act. I mean, you can probably think of various products that have been marketed to you where, you know, like the Geico stuff or different types of things where you already know the slogan or something along these lines. Well, why? Because it was done repetitively. Maybe you bought that product or maybe you didn't. But in some cases, it takes repetition before a finally a person finally comes around. I've seen this when someone sends out a postcard and they've actually had patients tell them, you know, prospective new patients will come into the practice with a postcard and it's the third or fourth postcard they received. They said, you know, this is the fourth time I got your postcard. I figured I should just show up. They didn't show up on the first time, second time, third time, but they showed up on the fourth time. Sometimes it takes a while for people to get it. You may have seen this where you've explained this to a, a treatment plan to a patient you know, six months ago. And to you, you've already forgotten about it because you've seen 20 patients a day for the next six months. They come back. And they go, you know, doctor, you know that thing you were telling me last time I was here? Well, I finally think I'm ready to go ahead and do it. 
And you're kind of thinking, well, what, what was it even? Oh, yeah, look at the chart. Oh, yeah, you're, you're ready to proceed with this treatment. Okay, good. You'd forgotten all about it. But for them, it took them a while to move, you know, to, to change their mind or make a decision. Some people move faster than others. So in some cases, it might take talking to a patient three, four, five, six times before they finally go, yeah, I guess the doctor's serious about this. Maybe I should just go ahead and do it. This is a health issue. And I'm not talking about, you know, aesthetic issues as long as it isn't infringing on the, and it's not active disease or something, or it's messing up their function. You know, if, if it's veneers, you can't really get very, you, know, you really need these veneers. If they want to improve their smile, they do, but it's not something that they need necessarily for their health, Right. That's more of a desired thing as opposed to a health thing. It's not active disease in a lot of cases, right? So, but in the case of, of you know, crowns, implants, et cetera, sometimes it takes a while for the, the message to arrive to the patient and that depends on the person. So assuming just because I talked to somebody three or six or, you know, last year, months ago or however long, that they're going to instantly say the exact same thing that they said when they were in last time. Um, is a silly viewpoint and it's actually sort of a bad thing to do from a sales perspective. This is something if you, if you know somebody who's been involved in sales and has been successful that they would never do. They would never decide because the person said no last time that they shouldn't ask or at least talk to the person again because people change their minds. People's circumstances change. Do you see? I mean, for all you know, uh, you know, they were watching TV last week and there was a special on about this person who had a toothache and ended up in the hospital and they went, gosh, you know, next time I see the dentist, I better get this taken care of because I don't want to end up in the hospital. Who knows? But the bottom line is your job is to make patients healthy. So if they're not healthy, you got to tell them. So I would, uh, you know, I would make sure that any patient coming into your practice that day that has outstanding treatment is spoken to about it, even if they were spoken to about it three months ago or six months ago. You know what? They might say no again, but I guarantee you in a lot of cases, even though you think they won't, they're going to say yes. And again, it's important for the patient's health, but also for the practice, it's a lost source of revenue. You're going to re start to recapture that revenue, but that's the biggest reason most of these cases go undone is because just nobody speaks to them. Which brings us to the next reason, which is usually the time to actually discuss these cases with patients. So yeah, you might realize, okay, uh, Jim here had this outstanding treatment last time he was here six months ago, but I don't really have time to talk to Jim about it today. So then nobody talks to Jim or your treatment coordinator or your front desk as asks them you know, briefly if they'd like to do it and it doesn't go anywhere. Well, Without getting into all the ins and outs of this, I talked about this, I think, two episodes ago when I, I think it's called Simplifying the Case Acceptance Process. I'm pretty sure that's the name of the episode. But I got into the idea of baking time into your schedule for treatment presentations, and not just the big FMR cases and all NX cases. I'm talking about even three, four, five thousand dollar cases. Well, of course, you'd use that time to present treatment to new patients because that's going to be, you know, uh, that would, that would be natural. And that's what most people can understand, but you'd use that time also to present treatment to patients of record. So you come into the operatory, I'm there for a recall appointment and you've only got five minutes because you're back due and that you've just numbed a patient up to start a root canal. And I needed extensive amount of treatment that I said no to last time I was here six months ago. Well, you might do my exam and say, Hey, Jeff, you know what? I'd like to see you back for a consultation appointment. You and I need to discuss a few things that I found that are going on in your mouth or however you want to say it, whatever you think feels best. And I might ask, well, what are they, doctor, whatever? You know what? Let, let's just get into it when we're here. And I'm, I'm setting an appointment as a consultation where it's just me and you, where you have my undivided attention. I'm there to answer your questions. I can go over what I discovered today during my examination, and I could go over what I'd like to do to actually take care of it. It'll take us about 20 minutes, and I'd like to get you in within the next one to three days. And if you have this time baked into your schedule, you can even ask your, your assistant or the hygienist who's there, hey, when's my next appointment like this available? Oh, day after tomorrow at 8, 820. Uh, could you make it day after tomorrow at 820? Yeah, I could make that doctor. Okay, good. And if the patient starts to get into, well, what did you find? What is this? What is that? You know, I would, I would not get into the answer to them. Look, I want to make sure I review everything before I sit down with you. I want to make sure we explain it properly, however you want to do it. Okay. But the idea is get them back to where you have uninterrupted time to explain this to the patient. You know, one thing you could do too is, you know, you look, uh, I'd like to get you in within one to three days. You know, hey, I could squeeze you in Thursday at 820. Could you make it Thursday at 820? Make it important. Don't get into the treatment that day because then you start the sales process, but use that consult time that you're setting aside, not just for new patients, 
but use it for patients of record if you don't have time to properly present that case today. The same rule applies that we teach, you know, we teach our clients this, that don't start presenting a case unless you have time to close it because it's actually worse to leave it midstream. You're better off having not presented it at all uh, and presenting it at a later time than to half present it. But uh, that applies to new patients, of course, but it also applies to patients of record, okay? So use that consult time. Make sure you have time to do it. So the first reason, it just doesn't get done at all because we assume the person's going to say no. The second reason, we don't have time. And the third reason is it's, you know, when, when we have a new patient, it's, it's a total different, um, you know, if you want to think of this from a, you know, from a business perspective, if you're manufacturing something, we have raw materials coming into the business and we're going to make something out of it, right? Well, a new patient is a type of, a different type of raw material than a patient of record to a degree. So with a new patient, we have a whole thought process associated with new patients. At least most practices do. You know, we're going to do this. And we're going to see them for an hour or an hour and a half, and then we're going to do the treatment presentation. And we're going to do this and do that. With a patient of record, it's you know they're coming into hygiene. We're going to do a recall exam, and they may or may not have treatment or whatever, and move on. Well, no one looks. This is why one of the first things we teach a client is to do something we call a morning production meeting. And I'll put a, a copy of that handout as it's free. It's a, I'll put it as a download on the episode webpage. But what's the whole point of a morning production meeting? Well, you want to, if you want to have a predictable level of revenue, then you should have an idea of what's walking into your practice every day and what could you sell. You know, nothing's going to end up on your schedule to produce unless you sell it. And maybe you hate the word sales, but sorry, you're a salesperson whether you like it or not. We could call it whatever we want, case presentation. I don't care what we call it, but it's still sales. You're you're explaining something to somebody so that they understand it and want it and pay for it. That That's sales, okay? And in the plus in your case is you're selling things people actually need. You're not selling a useless widget that they have absolutely no use for, right? That has no benefit to them. You're selling extremely beneficial services, but you're still having to sell them. If you didn't have to sell, patients would just – you could just hand them a piece of paper with their treatment plan and then hand you their credit card. But we know that that's not how things work. It needs to be sold. So – when you're selling, you know, selling is what creates income, which thereby creates production, right, in your practice. But we want to have some control over our collections or our sales. Well, the only way you can have control over your collections or sales and have some prediction over it is you need to see what's coming into your practice every day. For the morning production meeting, without getting into the, you know, who does what in the meeting, that's in the handout. But essentially what you're doing is you're looking at, okay, who's coming into the practice today with outstanding treatment? You know, they might be in hygiene. They might be on your schedule as the doctor. But let's say you have two hygienists running and you see that the 10 o'clock patient has uh, was diagnosed with three crowns and some fillings six months ago or three months ago, and that has not been accepted yet. So someone's going to have to talk to that person today. Like, do you see? And I'll get into that in a second. But let's say you're looking at this throughout the day. You're, you're looking at it. You're doing what we – you're creating what we call a lineup. You're looking at all the opportunities that are walking into your practice that day. So there's the patient at 11 o'clock. There's another patient with the other hygienist at 10 o'clock. There's another one at noon and there's one in the afternoon and there's one here. Now, what's the difference between looking at this and a new patient? Well, you know, with these patients of record, you already diagnosed the treatment. So you have an actual idea of what you could potentially sell. There's an actual dollar amount associated with it. You diagnose this with this patient, this, this, this. So then you'll see, okay, today I have $26,000 in outstanding treatment coming into the practice. It has an actual number associated with it. And if you're trying to collect a certain amount in a given month or produce a certain amount in a given month, that gives you a basis for lining up how you're going to do that. You see, so I have 26000 coming in today. I can close that one, that one, that one. And let's say our monthly quota is to do 12000 a day. Okay, if I close half of it, we're on track for our monthly quota. That's an actual number. You can't do that with new patients because – who knows what the new patient needs? They may need nothing. I mean, maybe you got some data on your intake form, which helps, but you still don't know what's going on, what's happening with their teeth. Uh, can they afford the treatment you're going to present? You don't know any of this stuff. It's a complete unknown quantity. 
even if you're doing an implant consultation, sure, they might need implants, but they can't pay for implants or you're doing a second opinion. You know, I'm not saying these things aren't good, new patients and implant consultations and you know, second opinions and things. These are all great, but you can't put a figure on it because you haven't met the person yet. You haven't diagnosed the treatment, so you can't line anything up with it. So if you're trying to base your revenue off, I have a bunch of these new patients in – and I hope I'm going to collect ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars today. You can't predict that, whereas you can predict it with the patients of record that are already on your schedule. So, do you see how this sort of flows? If I'm not lining up who's coming in the next day, I'm not looking at the next day and go, "Okay, I have all these patients coming in. This one needs this. This one needs this. This one needs that." And I don't have time to sell to these people, or I'm not even bothering because they said no last time. I'm missing out on all that potential treatment, then where does my focus immediately go? Oh, I have an implant consultation at four and I have a new patient here who says they have a broken tooth and I have a new patient here. And you're hoping you're going to make your revenues that way. If you're a general practitioner and you're surviving off new patients only, you've basically turned yourself into a specialist. You're now an oral surgeon or an endodontist. I'm not saying clinically, but from a business model perspective. If I'm an endodontist, I am living off of new patients because that's how that practice is structured. And that's fine. Okay, but if you're a general practitioner, that is not where the majority of your your revenue should be coming from. They should be coming from your patients of record. So in this morning production meeting, I'm looking at all of this. And then on top of that, it's not like I'm just looking at it and going, okay, cool. I have all this outstanding treatment. I now have to figure out, and this is in the handout, it explains this. How are we going to present this today? Who is going to present this today? Is everybody coordinated? So the treatment coordinator knows at 11 45, I'm going to be in the hygiene op talking to Jim, who I diagnosed three crowns and some fillings on last time he was here, and he or she is going to be with me while I talk to Jim so we can close that case and get Jim on the schedule. And guess what? We're already aware of what openings I have in primary time over the next you know, week. I have an opening day after tomorrow for two hours. I have an opening on Monday for an hour. So we're going to be trying to fill these openings with these cases that we close. That's why you're doing the morning production meeting, and it puts eyes and attention on your patients of record to make sure that you're actually converting these treatment plans. Now, of all these people that we lined up that morning, is everybody going to accept? No, but a good chunk can, and that that all comes back to sales skill, which again, I recommend you do the communications and sales seminars. We teach you those skills in there. Again, the link is on the episode webpage. That is my shameless plug of of the week, but- That comes down to sales skill, but I guarantee you if you at least present it and you have adequate time to present it, you will close something and you will start to convert some of these opportunities that you have not been converting and again, improving your patient's health. So that's the third thing. No lineup, no morning production meeting is why you lose these opportunities. Now, the last reason people miss these opportunities is a bit of a specialized one. So let's say you do your morning production meeting and you have time to sell and you've decided you're going to represent any treatment you've already diagnosed, even though the patient said, you know, six months ago said no. You might go, well, you're being pushy. You're not. You know, your job is to restore their health. So if they're not healthy, you got to talk to them. But let's say you've, you've got all that lined up. You're going to do that. But then you look at your hygiene schedule and there's no treatment to present. All the patients coming in, you know, have no outstanding treatment. You did it already. Well, first off, well done. But now, secondly, here's the thing I would most likely point out is happening in your practice. So let's say this is you and you have one hygienist and you've been in practice for, I don't know, 10 years and you have three or 4,000 charts and you look at your hygiene schedule for that day and it's, you know, the, the word I've heard new clients use is my hygiene schedule is clean. Well, what's most likely happening in that situation is your problem isn't the patients who are keeping their hygiene appointments. It's the Your problem is you have a ton of patients that are not being kept active in the practice. In the communications and sales seminars, we go over something called the scale of sales resistance. I'm not going to get into all the specifics here. Uh, we also covered on our online platform, DES Success. I'll put a link to that on the episode webpage. Uh, Dr. Winteregg talks about it. But generally speaking, The top 20% of people that come into your practice are going to be your best patients. These are going to be the patients who do everything you tell them, who if, you know, let's say they miss a hygiene appointment, they're chasing your office to get back on the hygiene schedule. You don't even have to call them. Well, if you've been around for a while and have accumulated three, four thousand, five thousand 5,000 charts, uh, you know, a thousand of these people are going to show up pretty routinely. 
And you might go, well, hygiene's booked. So, you know, I have nowhere to put people or I'm booking out, but you've only got one hygienist. But you're ignoring the other three or 4,000 charts that you have because the top 20, beyond the tw top 20%, you have, you know, the next 60% of patients who are great people. They just need a little bit more work to keep them active in your practice. People need to call them. People need to follow up to get them on the schedule. They're busy. You know, it, it has nothing to do with their dental IQ or whether they care about their teeth or not. It's just the way things are. Okay. Well, if you're not following up on these people, you're artificially suppressing your hygiene schedule. Your hygiene schedule should be at with that many charts, you know, four full-time hygienists, but you have one. So your problem is not the patients who are already coming in because those are the people who did everything you told them to anyway. It's the patients that aren't coming in that no one is following up on. And I got into this a little bit. I've actually covered this in a number of different episodes. I actually talked about it a little bit in last week's episode, patient retention. So if you're not actively chasing patients to keep them on the hygiene schedule, chasing is maybe the wrong, uh, you know, verb, but, you know, actively working on your patient base to keep them active. If this is not something that you're doing uh, as part of your business process, you're going to lose a lot of your patients. Maybe they're not going to go to other practices, but they're not going to stay active. But these are the patients who have the outstanding treatments. The ones who show up then are the ones who did all the treatment you told them. So, if you have that situation where you have a ton of charts, one hygienist or not a lot of hygiene, and everybody in your hygiene schedule is clean, I would look into your charts, look at your incomplete treatment list, and you'll find a lot of these people just aren't scheduled for hygiene, and you should be really working on your reactivation efforts at that point to get people back into the practice. But these are just a few ideas on this. There's obviously a lot I could cover on this, but – like I said, at least 60% of your revenues should be coming from your patient base. These are a few ideas on how you can recapture some of that stuff. Um, and it's definitely something that I advise that you do. It makes your life a lot easier. You're not just living off of new patients, which you shouldn't be anyway if you're a general dentist. I definitely advise you get new patients, but it should not be the only place that you live. I hope it helps. Try it out. Tell me how it goes. I have the downloads that I mentioned, the morning production meeting on the episode webpage. I also have those links to the MGE communication and sales seminars and the and DDS success or online platform. If you want more info on MGE, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Folks, have a great week, and I will see you at the next episode.